Our scripture today comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 25. It's Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 25. And it says, and every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for their feet. For by a single offering, he was perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our God, you have the words of eternal life. Speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit that we might hear what you would say to us today. Amen. Amen. Enter with confidence. That is our subject today. Enter with confidence. This text describes a setup. We have been set up by God due to one perfect offering made for us the offering of the body and blood of Jesus Christ once for all. Have you ever heard the term sugar daddy? <laughs> take it easy, take it easy. <laughs> yes, I know it has a very negative connotation. A sugar daddy is usually defined as a rich older man who lavishes gifts on a young woman in return for her company or certain favors. The, these gifts aren't free. They cost her, her pride, her dignity, and eventually her soul. She uses him and he uses her. In many instances, the sugar daddy will set up his young woman in an apartment or in a luxurious living situation, and she never has to worry about money. It's a financial arrangement. It's a setup. <laughs> However, this setup is built on deception. It's built on deception. Now, what God has done for us can almost feel like a sugar daddy arrangement, but, but the difference being is we don't have to sell our souls to the devil. Uh, 
Our souls have already been purchased by the blood of Jesus and therefore repositioned for freedom, not slavery. Yes, we have been bought, but Jesus paid it all and return, in return, he asked us to confess and believe. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. <laughs> you will be saved. See, this is the recipe for salvation. Why has God asked us to confess and believe? Well, it's because God desires the best for us. God has no desire to be our sugar daddy, but instead, our Abba Father. God desires our intimacy and our obedience. This is what the term Abba is grounded in. Abba denotes a relationship of the heart, hmm? a special closeness between you and God. And so when you refer to God as Abba, Father, it means that you stand ready to obey. Hmm? Your will be done. God desires to provide the best for us. And this does require our trust in him and our obedience to his word. Truthfully, God has already given us more than money can buy. He's given us eternal life. He's given us a peace that surpasses human understanding. And he's given us joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We are his heirs, his children. We have been included in the last will and testament. God has made provisions for our future. We are set up for eternal life. It's a setup. In Christ, we have been repositioned for greatness. Hmm? Do you feel great today? Hmm? Yeah, that, that was a question. Do you feel great today? <laughs> Believe it or not, the hard work has already been done. It has been accomplished on the cross. Now we must simply walk into our destiny. And this means we must begin to walk where God is leading us and this path may vary from the path we're currently on. It may be an altogether different path. It may be a path that goes backwards before it can go forward. But whatever direction God calls you to, when you follow Jesus, the result is victory. Hmm? Victory. The journey, however, will be filled with ups and downs and highs and lows and uncertainty. But what is certain is we cannot go wrong with our savior. We cannot go wrong. The text states that when Christ had offered for all time a sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. So, so Jesus has enemies. And I think one of the reasons we hesitate to walk into our destiny is the enemy of doubt. And with doubt comes fear. And with fear comes discouragement. And with discouragement comes distraction. And then disbelief and eventually distance. Hmm? We have moved away from God. And we're right back where we started as if Christ died in vain. 
as if his sacrifice was no big deal, as if transformation and sanctification were not possible. What we're essentially saying to God is I can't change. You can't change, they can't change. But because of what Christ has done by a single offering, we have been perfected, been made holy. And I know you're scratching your head and you're saying, look, I'm not perfect. (laughs) And you know what? You're right. You're right. Doesn't it feel good to be right? (laughs) Doesn't it feel good to be right? I myself am nowhere near perfect, (laughs) but, and I really want you to get this, but this is what's so amazingly wonderful and generous about God. This is the setup. This is the part that really blows my mind. This is the belief part. You know how we have to confess and believe? This is the belief part, the faith part. Our father gave his son who made the ultimate sacrifice for us and died for all of our sins. His sacrifice put us back in right relationship with God. In fact, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. See, can't forget the in Christ part, right? We have been made right through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what does God desire in return? Hmm? That we confess and believe and that we become followers of his son, the one that we confess and believe in, Hmm? making him the Lord of our lives. See, I think for most of us, we have confessed, we have believed, but this lordship business, (laughs) we're not doing that. We're not doing that. See this, but this is the doing part, right? We have the belief part, but this is the doing part. When we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, this is when we begin to change. This is when the transformation happens. When we begin to desire God's path for us, because we recognize that this is the path that we've been praying for. It's the way to living a fulfilled life. It's really a win-win for us. When we confess and believe, God now sees us through the eyes of his son. God now sees us as he created us to be, filled with all kinds of possibilities. He sees our giftedness. He sees our goodness, our greatness. God sees us as we were designed and not as the world sees us not even as we have come to see ourselves and definitely not as the world labels us. The world can easily strip us of our confidence, of our faith, of our self-esteem and cause up to curl up and die. The world says that we're lazy, that we're no good. And that we are not enough. Hmm? That we're too much of this and not enough of that. In Psalm 27, David speaks to the Lord with confidence. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He says, the war break out against me. Even then I will be confident. I will remain confident of this. 
I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now that's a confident statement. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Have you, have you been in the land of the living recently? It's pretty messed up. Hmm? Looks pretty hopeless, right? Every day I'm saying, well, God, where are you? Where are you in all of this? Hmm? But David is saying, I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord before I die, right? In, in the land of the living. David is praying as if he knows God. Hmm? There seems to be a level of intimacy and closeness. He is speaking with power and authority and confidence in who he is and whose he is. Do you feel confident about your faith? Can you express it with clarity and conviction and confidence? Can you? I ask you these questions because all things have been put in place for us to walk in this confidence. We have been repositioned in Christ for greatness. We already have the tools. Abba Father has set his children up with hope and a future. So my questions, I have so many questions for you today to reflect on. Are you excited about the future? Hmm? Are you excited about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you confident in your beliefs? Hmm? Because this particular text, this particular epistle to the Hebrews is very controversial. People debate it all the time. It doesn't really show up in the lectionary that much. People love to debate. They love to argue about God. But can you stand sure-footed in your faith? Do you actually believe what you're saying or have you gone down the slippery slope of doubt? And I'll tell you, if, if you believe and if you know, if you know in your knower that God has been good to you, that God woke you up this morning, not your alarm clock, that God put a roof over your head, that God has stood by you through all of your craziness, through all of your junk, if you know these things and if you're grateful, say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, it is unclear who the writer of this epistle to the Hebrews is. Most theologians do not credit Paul as the writer. In, in, in reading this Christocentric letter or what's referred to as a high Christology, all about the Christ. One gets the sense that the author was very confident in his beliefs and very confident in stating them. He speaks of Jesus with authority and conviction. He's not doubting the stuff he knows. Hmm? And he's not doubting the mysterious stuff he can't rightly explain. Hmm? He's humbled. He realizes that he don't know everything. <laughs> he, this writer is, is amazing, right? Because he has provided the recipe for that confidence. Hmm? He's speaking with confidence and he's telling us how to get that confidence. So would you like some of that confidence today? Hmm? Do you desire to express your faith with assurance? If you said yes, can't see everybody, 
But if you said yes, and if you thought yes, then the first thing I need to know from you is do you like salad? Oh God, I had to crack myself up on that. Do, do you like salad? Because if you like salad, you're really gonna love this recipe put forth by this writer. See, the salad recipe I'm about to give you has a great deal of lettuce in it. Lettuce. The first lettuce is, let's call it butter, butter lettuce. Okay, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscious and conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's, that's butter lettuce. Romaine lettuce. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And lastly, good old iceberg, iceberg lettuce. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. There it is. You got your salad. Now, if you throw some Holy Spirit dressing <laughs> over that, you got yourself faith and confidence overflowing. So I just want us to examine just for a few minutes these three lettuces, lettuces, <laughs> right? The first one, a true heart in full assurance of faith sprinkled clean from evil and our bodies washed with pure water. See, this ingredient includes confession and repentance, right? We're trying to get to a pure heart when we come before God. Our bodies have been raised up with Christ, right? Through our baptism. And we are now a new creation, washed clean and made free. So just that first lettuce <laughs> should give us confidence, right? That we have been raised up with Christ. The second one, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. Well, what is the writer teaching us here? He's saying, stop being double-minded. Stop being so indecisive about your faith. Stop allowing others to rock the boat so much that you tip over and get off. Because when we keep our focus on the one who is faithful, we are more inclined to endure, to persevere, to keep on the path walking nearer and nearer to Jesus. And our last ingredient, ingredients for confidence, right? Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Hmm? Together. Hmm? Together, we give each other confidence. We build each other up. We encourage one another. We spur each other on to love and good deeds. Because when one of us has doubt, the other has enough faith for the both of us. We need each other. We must not neglect the fellowship. When you wake up on Sunday morning, and you're thinking, ah, should I go to church today? Yes. Don't even make it a question. Do not neglect the fellowship. Our fellowship with God and our fellowship with each other is where our confidence is. Confidence doesn't come from spectating. It comes from participating. 
So to sum it up, <laughs> when your heart is pure towards God, when you're not being tossed about by every new idea, but instead remain steady, steady in your faith. And when you fellowship with like-minded people, staying connected to the body and not neglecting it, something happens. Something happens. Your posture becomes upright. Your head is lifted up. Your joy is back. Your thoughts are clear. This, this recipe that the, that the writer is, is giving us is one of confidence. You don't walk in fear anymore. You're not afraid to say what's in your heart because you are more interested in pleasing God than anyone else. And so you say with a new confidence, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Hmm? Who dares to get in my path and try to block me? Hmm? You believe in your heart, the Lord is your refuge and your strength. And no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will send his angels concerning you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord God will be with you wherever you go. You, my siblings, are fearfully and wonderfully made God's masterpiece. So the first recipe confess and believe. Right? That, 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 that essentially is the main course, right? That is, that is the road to salvation, confess and believe. That is the main course, but we all need a vegetable, don't we? <laughs> we all need a vegetable. And so we have a salad, right? That your heart must be pure, must remain consistent and not neglect the body. Follow the recipe and be confident in the Lord. Amen. Amen.